Greetings! It is I, Tantus Nairan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome! It is time to continue our discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, where we go set by set, release by release, going over all the various products that Wizards of the Coast has released over the years that give us magic cards. Going over all the details of the set, mechanics introduced, and a lot of important and interesting cards that you might want to play with. Let's continue our dive into the Mega Block, which included two different mini blocks, with the set Shadowmore, which was the first set, of course, in the Shadowmore Mega mini cycle. Now, this was released on May 2nd of 2008, and as I said, this was the first set in the Shadowmore block, third set in the Mega block that contained Lorwyn and Shadowmore. It had 301 cards. Now, it had the mechanics of hybrid mana, of untapping, and, of course, of minus one, minus one counters. It had the keywords of conspire, persist, and wither. Now, this plane, well, Shadowmore, the set itself, is named after the plane it takes place in, which is, in fact, a reflection of Lorwyn. They are the same, yet different, and this is reflected in the mechanics. This set contains none of the same mechanics that existed with Lorwyn. Instead, it has a lot of mirrors. For example, Lorwyn had plus one, plus one counters as a, as a mechanic, while on the other hand, Shadowmoor has minus one, minus one counters as a major mechanic. Now, while Lorwyn contained very few multicolor cards, multicolor cards are a major focus of Shadowmoor. Now, it's also important to note that every major race that appeared within the Lorwyn block appears here in Shadowmoor, with one exception. There is an extra race that's been added in here, a race of artifact creatures, Scarecrows. Now, the hybrid mana theme, which exists here, of course, was hybrid mana being originally introduced in Ravinica, was expanded here. But the hybrid mana connected a lot with allied colors. That was the major theme here, hybrid mana with allied colors. It is also important to note here that many of the basic lands were paired together. This doesn't mean that I would have two islands next to each other and they'd share a picture. This means I would have an island and a plains, and I would have them next to each other, and they would share a picture. They were connected together. Every basic land had a pairing like this. Now, the symbol for Shadowmare represents a couple of different things. For one thing, it could be a bat wing. It could be a fallen leaf that was dead. It could even be connected to one of the legends of the set, the Reaper King, the powerful Scarecrow. It's head pet piece. Now, the fact is that for the storyline, Shadowmoor was once Lorwyn. What in fact happened is the greater war occurred and altered the land itself. What was once day is now night, which was once a pristine area filled with life. It's now filled with death, rotting trees, darkness shrouded in fog and danger where terror and death are around every corner to plague those that live here clear waters are brackish cold winds blow through dead trees the place has altered completely and utterly now every major race that existed within lorwyn has had their colors altered except for fairies fairies are the only race that has had their colors remain the same, and whether this is replacing a color that was connected to them with another, or perhaps removing a color that was once associated with them, is dependent on the actual race itself. Now this was of course sold in 16 card booster packs, it was also sold in 5 pre-constructed decks, a fat pack, and a tournament pack. Now it is important to note that in every product except for the booster pack, there was indeed a pro tour card here. The fat pack was altered here to become closer to what we have in our modern day versions of a fat pack. No longer was it two boxes, now it went down to one box, and they changed the number of booster packs associated with the fat pack from six to eight. The change in size with no longer having the dual boxes, dual holders, meant that the panoramic picture also shrunk though. Now, the pre-release was in April 19th to 20th of 2008 and had a pre-release card of Demigod of Revenge. When the release came around, they had a release card of Vexing Shusher for any release fence you would go to. 
Now, the set was accompanied by an anthology of the same name. This wasn't just a normal novel. This was a collection of stories set in the Shadowmoor universe, rather than just one large story telling the tale of this world. Now, much like the previous sets that have been currently coming out in the timeline as we're talking about it, there was this 16th card here, which in this case was represented by a card that was either rules or a token. There were... 18 combined of them, six different rules cards, and 12 different tokens, including the spider token here. There was also six different ads which would appear on the backs of these cards. Now there was one major misprint in this set. It happened in the foil versions of the cards. For the foil version of Reflecting Pool, in the description on the text box, the white mana symbol appeared as if this land was particularly a non-basic land that tapped for white. This is a misprint as Reflecting Pool taps for any color mana, so there should not have been a symbol there. So Shadowmoor expands some of the previous mechanics that existed, and in particular, of course, hybrid mana. In this case, we have monocolored hybrid mana. This is an interesting and different take on hybrid. In this case, rather than being two different colors, you could either pay one mana of the chosen color or two colorless in its place. Now, oh, this meant that I could pay all colorless, or really any color, to play this spell if I wanted to. I didn't have to just say, like, for example, if it was green and two colorless, I wouldn't have to pay that two plus green. I could pay all colorless. Now, it's an interesting thing that if we're talking about converted mana cost, we go to the maximum amount this one could have. So if it was three of these hybrid mana, this means the converted mana cost would be six. Two colors for each of them. Now, also, we introduced the untap symbol. This was, of course, the opposite of the tap symbol. Untap symbol meant that I could untap this creature for an effect. The important note here is the creature needs to be tapped. Whatever it needs is it needs to be tapped before you can use the untap symbol. That means that if I have to attack, use something else to tap it, doesn't matter. It has to be tapped before I could use this to untap it. This appeared primarily in white and blue. Now, we also saw an introduction of lands which had a basic land type without being a basic land. This means it would be called a forest, a mountain, an island. The fact is that these function just like those basic lands, except being non-basic, but they came into play tapped as a way of making them not as good as the basic lands. They wanted to mitigate them a little bit. They also, though, each had a special ability that you could activate using mana, and it would be dependent on if you had permanence of the color that the matches the basic land type it is. So, for example, as a forest, you would need two green creatures. You would tap this land then, having those two green creatures under your control, and you were allowed to activate its ability. So you had to have those creatures, or those permanents, really, of that color to activate the abilities on these lands. Now, three keywords were introduced here. First off is Conspire. Conspire, when you would play a spell with Conspire, you were allowed to tap two creatures that shared a color with the spell that you were casting, and then you copied it. Simple as that. So if I'm casting a red spell, I, cast, I tap two red creatures, I can copy my red spell, choose different targets for each of these copies. Persist was a status-based effect that when this creature with Persist would be put into the graveyard for play, and it did not have a minus one, minus one counter on it, you returned it to the battlefield with a minus one, minus one counter on it. Effectively, this creature could die once and then come back and would have the minus one, minus one counter on it. Now, if you had things that would combo with removing minus one, minus one counters, this means it would be very difficult, very persistent, that these creatures would keep returning. Wither was an ability that if a creature had a wither, it would deal damage rather than just straight up damage in the form of minus one, minus one counters. Now, it would still deal damage to an opponent as normal, but when it would hit a creature, they would, instead of just taking damage, get minus one, minus one counters on them. They would shrink until they would, well, die. Now, this set had 27 cycles on it. Seven of the cycles were in fact part of mega cycles that lasted the entire block, entire Shadowmoor block. Let's talk about those. First was the common hybrid mana one drop cards. These would be just that. It would cost you one hybrid mana and it would drop the creature out. 
a simple common creature for one hybrid mana. There were the demigods. The demigods were represented by a combination of five different hybrid mana. They were spirit avatars. There was the demigod auras. These were, once again, a hybrid spell, but the enchanted creature would get plus one, plus one. Now, if it matched one of the colors of the thing, it would have an effect. If it matched the other color of this spell, it would have an effect. And if it matched both of them, it would get plus two, plus two instead of plus one, plus one. Effectively, it would get bigger, and it would get additional effects if it matched the color of the enchantment. So if you were playing one that was a white-blue, and you put it on a white-blue creature, it would have the max amount of effects. You can still play it on a white creature, or on a blue creature, you just have half the effects. There were the hybrid filter lands. These were lands that would come into play tapped, but you could either tap at them for a colorless, or you could tap a hybrid mana, one of a pair of mana, and as a result, you would get two mana in any combination between that hybrid. So, for example, if it was a blue-white that you would tap hybrid mana blue-white, you'd either get two white, two blue, or a blue and a white. You would filter it into two of a combination of that allied color. There were the allied color modal spells. These, of course, would have an effect and have basically two effects depending on the mana that was used to cast it. Since they're hybrid mana to begin with, you could choose the two manas that the mana that you're using for it, but oftentimes it had more than one mana, meaning that you could technically play both different colors of mana and have two different effects combined, rather than just one or the other. You would choose, using your mana, which of the two effects, or both, you would use. The hybrid three drop creatures were just that. Pretty decent creatures that cost you three hybrid mana to play. Would have an ability that matched with the two colors of mana that were used in summoning this creature. And then finally, for the mega cycles that lasted across both blocks, both sets, lieges. The lieges were creatures that would give a plus one plus one bonus to each other creature of one of their colors, a plus one plus one bonus to each other creature of their other color, and technically speaking, since it had both of these, plus two plus two to creatures that shared both their colors. These would stack with each other, and they oftentimes would have an ability which, of course, would match their color. Now, as I said, there were 20 more cycles that were just particular this block. The allied color self-boosting creatures. These were common creatures that had a hybrid mana that you would tap and get in a boosting effect to either power or toughness for this creature. The allied colored filter lands. These were effectively filter lands that you could either tap for a colorless or tap one of the hybrid mana that were represented within this block to filter it into a pair of colors, represented by either two of the same color or the pair of the allied color, your choice of these three combinations. There were basic land count spells, uncommon spells that would have an effect based upon the number of basic lands of a type that matched their color when they came into play, or were cast, I should say. The cohorts, which were creatures that would have plus one plus long as long as you controlled another creature of a color which matched them. There were the color line scarecrows. If you controlled a creature of one of the pair of the ally, this scarecrow would get some kind of bonus ability. If you controlled a creature of the other of this pair of allied colors, it would also gain an ability. And of course, if you controlled a creature of both colors, it would gain two abilities. It was a scarecrow that would be boosted for you controlling creatures of a pair of allied colors. There were the colored permanent count creatures. This creature had a power and toughness equivalent to the number of permanents of the color that matched them that you control. So if you were playing with the blue one, the more blue permanents you had, the bigger it would be. Now, and there was also the duos. Duos had three types, one race, two classes. They would gain a bonus until end of turn when you played a spell that would match one of their colors. There were hate enhanced spells, which had an effect, but a greater effect on the enemy colors of that spell. There were the hideaway creatures. They were a number of seven mana, converted mana cost legendary creatures, which matched the names, the themes of the hideaway lands from Lorwyn. They were supposed to be awakened forms of these lands. There were the hybrid conspire cards, common cards with conspire that had art matching one of the races of, of course, Lorwyn. There are the initiates, creatures that if you play a spell of its color, you may pay one mana to have an effect. 
They were the mentors, creatures that when they came into play, they would grant an effect to all creatures that matched a color with it. They're the monocolor conspiracy sorceries. These, of course, were common sorceries with conspire that were a single color. They're the monocolor hybrid cards. These, of course, were using that new monocolor hybrid mana. There was a cycle of them. There were rare persist cards. Persist cards with very powerful comes into play effects. So not only would you get it when it originally came into play, if it died, you'd come back, it would come back and you'd get it again. There were the reflections. These were powerful enchantments that double some kind of common event. Damage, life, life loss, card draw, mana. They double something under your control. There were the unblockable hybrid creatures. These were hybrid creatures that would be unblockable to the enemy color of both of their manas. There were utility lands. These, of course, were the basic lands I talked about. Well, lands with the basic land types. So these were uncommon lands with a basic land type tap for a colorless or for one mana. And if you had a number of two permanents, at least, of the color that matched the basic land type here, you could tap it for us another extra effect. There were the wisps, which were common cantrips that changed the color of a, of a creature until end of turn. The witches were uncommon hybrid creatures that were, had an ability that required both of their manas to activate. So it would be, if it was a blue-black witch, it would require a blue and a black to activate its ability. Now there were seven reprinted cards in the set, including Torture, which was originally published in Homelands. There was a colored shifted card, Power of Fire for Hermetic Study. Now several cards in this set were effectively reflections of cards that appeared within Lorwyn. There were six cards which were mechanical reflections. Effectively, they would have an ability that one would be one way, the other would be the opposite, a reflection of it. One might be draw, the other would be discard. There were also eight flavor reflections that had a flavor that was the opposite of the card here itself. So there were five pre-constructed decks. There was a white-blue one called Aura Mastery, a blue-black one called Mortal Coil, a black-red one called Army of Entropy, a red-green one called Overkill, and a green-white one called Turnabout. So they cycled through the five allied pairs. Now let's talk about some of the cards from this set. There was Fire Spout. This one was one of the modal hybrid color spells. If you paid red, it would do three damage to each creature without flying. If you used green, it would do three damage to each creature with flying. This was cheaper than using something like Earthquake or Hurricane and would do three damage across the board. So this was in fact seen as being superior to either of those and you could combine them two together. There were Kitchen Finks which when it came into play, you gained two life and had persist. This is a very popular one as it was one that was, of course, difficult to get rid of, persist. It was in white, which white actually did have a few combos for removing those minus one, minus ones, and you'd get two life, so there were plenty of combos using it. Murderous Red Cop was another popular one with persist, that when it came into play, it would deal damage equal to its power to target creature or player. You would burn them once, burn them twice. There was Painter Servant. When it came into play, you would choose a color. All cards not in play, spells, and permanents are the color that you have chosen beyond the colors they already have. You could effectively turn everything in play red, black, green, white, blue. You would just choose it, and this is beyond the colors they would already have. This would add color to things that were colorless. You made things colored. Reflecting Pool was in fact a reprint, but it was a very popular one. You could tap it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool that your lands could produce. So you already have lands out in play that can produce certain types of mana. Guess what? Reflecting Pool can tap to add any of those mana to your mana pool. There was Ruined Halo. When it came into play, you would choose a card by name. You would have protection from that card. Period. Lightning Bolt, Fireball, you name something, you'd have protection from it. This was in fact the first card that would grant a player protection from a card rather than a creature. Protection from anything in this case. There was, of course, Safe Right Quest. When you would play it, you would search your library for a forest or plains, reveal it, and put it in your hand. This was an interesting one because it allowed you to search for these two particular types of lands, rather than what most searches was, 
forest, or just basic lands. Save of the moment allows you to take an extra turn after this one, you skip that turn's untap phase. So unless you have a way of untapping all your stuff, well, you don't get to untap, but then again, you do get an extra turn. Things with Vigilance, you can attack with a second time. Smash the Smithereens allows you to destroy an artifact, and then you would deal three damage to that artifact's controller. Spectral Procession allows you to put three 1-1 one, one white flying spirit tokens into play. I get three spirits, pretty good one. Strip Bear, destroy all auras and equipment attached to target creature. That means if someone's building up a creature really big with a bunch of auras and enchantment and equipment, you tear them all away. The Swans of Bryn are goal. A flying creature that whenever it is dealt damage, prevent that damage. For each one damage that is prevented this way, the damage's controller, the damage source's controller, may draw one card. This one was interesting because it was combined with other things in the same deck, allowing you to do damage to your own swans and therefore allowing you to draw cards. That was the point of it in this case. That's the best combos for it. I hurt my own swan, I get a bunch of cards. Wheel of Sun and Moon enchants a player. Enchanted player, when a card would be put into a graveyard from anywhere of enchanted player, instead that card is revealed and put on enchanted player's bottom of their graveyard. This one, in fact, prevents milling. If I have Wheel of Sun and Moon, I cannot be milled because each time a card would go into my graveyard from anywhere, revealed, put back on the bottom of it. Now this does not get rid of the cards that are already in the graveyard, this does not prevent exile, but it is a great way of basically preventing your deck from ever disappearing. You won't draw out your deck, ever. Now there's Vexing Susher. Vexing Susher cannot be countered, and for a hybrid green-red, target spell can't be countered by spell or ability. So not only can it not be countered, it shuts down counter spells. It is the best anti-counter card you can get. Augury Adept. When this creature deals combat damage to an opponent, you may reveal the top card of your library, then put it into your hand and gain life equal to its converted mana cost. Beseech the Queen. You can search your library for a card with a converted mana cost of less than or equal to the number of lands you have in play. You reveal that card, put it in your hand, shuffle your library. So if you have a lot of mana out, this is actually slightly cheaper for all the lands you have, to get a card from your deck. Blightsickle. This is only a common one, but it's a great one to think about. It's equipped to, equipped creature gets plus one, plus O, oh, and wither. This is the best way in any deck, especially legacy, extended, in vintage, to give something wither. Anything wither. Boon Reflection. One of the reflections. Whenever you would gain life, instead you gain double that amount of life. If I'm playing in a life gain deck and I boon reflection out, I just double the amount of life I gain from every source. Excellent card for life gain. Cauldron of Souls, tap. Any number of target creatures gain persist until end of turn. Cauldron of Souls allows me to persist all my creatures. There's a combo in here with another card from this very set I'll be talking about a little later. I'll mention it. Chainbreaker. It comes into play with two minus one minus one counters on it, but for three in tapping it, I can remove a minus one minus one counter from target creature. This includes itself. This is a way in any color to remove minus one minus one counters. This does work with the Cauldron of Souls, but that's not the combo I was going to be talking about. Corrosive Mentor. All black creatures you control have Wither. It's one of the mentors and a very one of the better mentors because it gives everything black Wither. The other mentors give decent abilities, but this one I think is one of the better ones. Counterbore. Counter target spell. Then search that opponent's library, hand, and graveyard for copies of those spells. Exile those copies. So this means they will only be keeping one spell out of all of them. The one you're countering. But all the rest, all the other copies of this spell, remove from the game. It prevents them from, well, coming back. Dawn Glow and Fusion. It is an X spell, white green hybrid. If white mana was paid in the cost of this spell, you gain X life. If green mana was paid in the cost of the spell, you gain X life. This one is one of the best of all the X gain life spells because guess what? If I'm playing green and white, I gain double X. That means my big stream of lives and other similar spells 
are just outclassed by this one spell if you can put a little splash of white in your green deck. Bam. Deep Channel Mentor. Another one of the mentors which I think is very good. Blue creatures you control are unblockable. Simple as that. You make all your blue creatures unblockable. This and the Wither One are very powerful mentors. They're the best of the mentors as I believe it to be. And this one I do enjoy a lot because, hey, unblockable. Din of the Fire Herd. Put a 5-5 black and red elemental creature token into play. Then target player sacrifices a creature for each black permanent you control, then sacrifices a land for each red permanent you control. So even in a black deck, this will make your opponent sacrifice one land. Other than that, they sacrifice creatures. And this is sacrifice. The best way to affirm creatures because they get to choose. But if you have a lot of black creatures, you just wipe them out. Then again, if you're playing black and red at the same time, you just, well, wipe out everything. Creatures and land. Dire undercurrents. When a blue creature comes into play under your control, you may have target player draw a card. Not just you. That's an important factor here. Whenever a black creature comes into play, you may have target player discard a card. That means if you're playing blue and black, you can draw cards yourself if you wish, and cause all your opponents to, of course, discard cards. Dramatic Entrance. You may put a green creature from your hand into play. This means if you have a big, really expensive green creature, you can pay this for a lot less and put that right into play. Drowner Initiate. Whenever you play a blue spell, you may pay one. If you do, you mill that opponent. You may mill one opponent, two. So each time you play a blue spell, if you pay one extra mana, you mill an opponent, two. Not bad. Enchanted Evening. All, your per all permanents in play are enchantments, in addition to their other card types. That means I turn all my lands, creatures, artifacts, planeswalkers, into enchantments also. I mean, my enchantments were already enchantments. But that means enchantment destruction now targets everything. Enchantment control now targets everything. It's pretty good if you're using an enchantment deck where you're manipulating them. Hey, guess what? Everything's an enchantment. Everlasting torment. Players can't gain life. Damage can't be prevented. And all sources of damage are dealt as though that source had wither. That means now my, our life's totals can't get any bigger. Nothing can prevent damage from being tilted. And should I use burn spells even, they now do minus one, minus one counters to creatures instead of straight damage. I just shrink them away, which can be very mean. It means that if you can't burn them all completely, you can still destroy them. Flourishing defenses. Whenever a minus one, minus one counter is put on a creature, not your creatures, a creature, you may put a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token into the battlefield. If you're playing a deck with lots of things giving and receiving minus one minus one counters, you can get a lot of elves. Fracturing Gust. Destroy our artifacts and enchantments. For each permanent that was destroyed this way, gain two life. So I wipe out artifacts and enchantments and, hey, gain a bunch of life. Ghost Lord of Fugue. It is an unblockable creature that when it deals combat damage to an opponent, they reveal a hand. They reveal their hand. You choose a card from that hand, and they exile it. So this is a very mean way of revealing the hand, discarding your card of your choice, except this time it's exile a card of your choice. Gnarl Effigy. Four tap. Put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature. This is a great way that if you need some kind of combo with minus one, minus one counters that you eat them up to something else, hey, you can give them. Godhead of all. A four, four flyer that... All other creatures are 1-1 one, one creatures. Other creatures are 1-1. One, one. Bam. Now this doesn't stop plus one plus one counters from having an effect. It doesn't stop enchantments from having an effect. Other exterior sources. It's just their base power and toughness is 1-1. One, one. Greater Oromancy. Each other enchantment you control has Shroud. Enchanted creatures you control have Shroud. So not only does it give all your other enchantments Shroud... But all of your creatures that get enchantments on them now have Shroud instead. You give Shroud do a lot of things. Heartmender. A persist. At the beginning of your upkeep, remove a minus one, minus one counter from each creature you control. This is the one I would use with Cauldron of Souls. Because guess what? Give all my stuff persist. Oh, it all dies. It comes back. My next upkeep? 
all those minus one minus one counters go away, I can give them persist again. I can make them continually die and come back with the Heart Mender and Cauldron of Souls combined. There you go. Now it doesn't save tokens or one ones, but still. Hollowborn Bargeist. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have no cards in hand, each of your opponents loses two life. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if they have no cards in hand, they lose two life. So if I have no cards, my opponent has no cards, each opponent loses four life then. Howl of the Night Pack. Put a 2-2 two, two green wolf creature token into play for each forest you control. So for each forest I have, I get a 2-2 two, two creature. Ink Fathom Witch is a fear creature for two colorless, a blue, and a black. Each unblocked creature this turn becomes a 4-1. I can make all my unblocked creatures, whether with fear or unblockable, all the ones that were probably small. Make them the big old four ones that are each doing four damage to my opponent, right here and right now. Naxal Click. It's a flying with a one cutlass, one blue, untap effect. So I would have had a tap in the first place. I'm untapping it. Target opponent removes the top card of their library from the game. Until end of turn, you may play that card. That means I use my effect to untap to tap my click, untap it, and then BAM! I get a free card that maybe I can play, maybe I can't, but it's exiled if I can't. Cool Wrath Knight, a flying wither. Creatures and opponent controls that have counters on them cannot attack or block. So, if I start withering things, now they can't attack or block. Or if I have other ways of putting minus one, minus one counters, or any kind of counter on my opponent's creatures, they can't attack or block. I just remove them from being a threat to me. Leech Ridden Swamp. It is a swamp by type, even though it is not a basic land. So it comes into play, tap. I can tap it for a black mana. Or for one black, tap it. If I control two or more black permanents, each opponent loses one life. Mana Reflection. When a source I control would create mana, it creates double that amount of mana. So I can tap lands for mana, tap anything for mana, really. And I get double that mana with Mana Reflection. Mass Calcify. Destroy all non-white creatures. A other than white board wipe. So if you're playing a straight white deck, if you're playing anything other than white, even if you're playing a multicolored deck that has just some white in it, it can just ream the other, the other colors. At least creatures. Mercy Killing. Target creature's controller sacrifices it. You put X, 1-1, one, one, green, white, elf warrior creature tokens into the battlefield where x is that creature's that was sacrificed power get rid of a creature get a bunch of elf tokens midnight banshee a wither at the beginning of your upkeep put a minus one minus one counter on each non-black creature so if you're playing a straight black deck it just destroys every turn with all the non-black colors mist veil planes it is a Plains. Again, the non-basic one. Comes to play tapped, tap it for a white mana, or for a white, tap it. If you control two or more white permanents, put target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. Mossbridge Troll, my favorite of those legends based upon the hideaway lands. It is a 5-5 that if it would be destroyed, regenerate it. No need to pay any kind of costs. As soon as it's destroyed, regenerates it. This is its activated ability. Tap. Any number of creatures who that are untapped, whose power equals 10 or more. So, tap a bunch of creatures. Their combined power has to equal at least 10, if not more. Monster Patrol gets plus 20, plus 20 until end of turn. This is an activated ability I could do more than once. I could make Moss Patrol really big. I can tap 10 worth of power and double the amount of damage I could do, especially if I can give this thing trample. Ona, Queen of the Flay, a 5-5 five, five flyer that for X and hybrid blue or black, I choose a color, then target opponent puts the top X cards of their library into their graveyard. For each card of the chosen color that goes into the graveyard, I put a 1-1 one, one blue black fairy rogue token into play. So not only do I mill an opponent a bunch, I get tokens. Oracle of Nectars, X tap, gain X life. Is a really great one for an elf or a life gain deck because it just taps for X. Gain X life is a creature I could do it every turn. As great as Dawn Glow Infusion was that I talked about before, this one's in a way a little better. A little easier to kill because it's just a creature and that's a spell. But I can gain X life every turn. 
Order the White Clay. For one colorless, two white, and untapping it, so it's another untapped creature, return target creature the converted mana cost of three or less from the graveyard to play. It resurrects small mana cost creature. Plague of Vermin. Starting with you, you may pay any amount of life. Each player then does the same. And this keeps going until a player stops paying life. Then, each life a player paid, they put a 1-1 one, one rat, black rat token into play. So I could pay a whole bunch of life, get a whole bunch of rats, and we keep going around and people keep paying life. And it will come back to me and I can choose to pay more life again. And it will keep circling around like that until someone chooses just not to pay life anymore. Then we all get rats. Poison the well. Destroy target land. Its controller takes two damage. Polluted bond. Whenever a land would come into play under an opponent's control, that, uh, that player loses two life and you gain two life. So now you make it that each time an opponent plays a land, you get some life. You just suck the life out of them. Presence of Gone. Enchant creature. Enchant creature has. Tap. Put a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token into the battlefield. So I can now have this creature tap to create, well, more creatures. Prismatic Omen. Lands you control are every basic land type in addition to any kind of land types it had before. So now I make it that my lands could really tap for any color mana because there are all five land types at all times. Puka's Mischief. At the beginning of your upkeep, exchange control of target non-land permanent you control and another non-land target permanent that has an equal to equal or less converted mana cost than the permanent you're exchanging. So I take a permanent I own, I take an per my opponent's own. It's if it has equal or less converted mana cost, I switch them. Rage Reflection. Creatures you control have double strike. It's one of the better ways, at least at this point in time, to grant everything you control double strike. So very mean. Reaper King. It has a converted mana cost of 10, because guess what? It's got each of the hybrid mana of one of the color, two colorless. So I could pay 10 colorless, or I could play a rainbow to play it. Other scarecrows you control get plus one, plus one. When another scarecrow comes into play under your control, destroy target permanent. So it is the way to make a scarecrow deck mean and useful. Resplendent Mentor. The last mentor I'm going to talk about, and the only other really great mentor. The other two colored mentors that I haven't mentioned. Yeah, they're okay, but they're not as good as these three. Creatures you control have tap, gain one life. So now, at the end of your opponent's turn before your turn, if I had any creatures on tap left, tap them all, gain a whole bunch of life. I can keep tapping creatures, gaining life. So, there's also Wrist the Redeemed. Reborn once again, a new version of Wrist. This one is far better. For two colorless, one green-white hybrid mana, Tap it. Put a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature into battlefield. That is both green and white. So green, white, 1-1 one, one elf warrior token. Here's the kicker that makes Riss great in any deck you have green, in any deck you have white, that you create tokens. For four colorless, two green, white hybrid mana, six mana total. For each creature token you control, put a copy of that creature token into the battlefield. I double my creature tokens. Bam. If I had five elf tokens, now I have 10. This is exponential. The next turn, 20, 40, 80, etc. I double my tokens every turn. And that's why Riss is good. Roshan Mentor. Tap. Add four mana, colorless mana, to your mana pool. This can only be used to pay X spells. So if you're playing a green and or red deck that has a lot of X spells in it, this is something you're going to want, because she can get you four quick mana for those X spells. Spiteful Vision. At the beginning of each player's draw step, they draw an extra card. You now draw, well, two cards if it's just this alone. Draw extra card effectively. Whenever a player draws a card, Spiteful Vision does one damage to them. So you make it that if you have some kind of card draw deck and maybe either you can prevent the damage or give yourself just a little extra life. You make everyone else keep drawing cards and dying. I've seen this actually done in a very interesting deck that plays a lot of other things that make everyone draw cards. 
You play a whole bunch of them and a bunch of spiteful uh, visions. Well, everybody starts taking a lot of damage. And while well, since you are the first person to play everything, well, you're drawing the least. Sig, rather, River Cutthroat. New version of Sig. A reflected version of Sig. At the end of a turn, if an opponent lost three or more life, you may draw a card. So every turn that an opponent lost life, even if it wasn't caused by you in a multiplayer game, you draw a card. Thought Reflection. Whenever you would draw a card, instead you draw two cards. I just doubled the amount of cards I draw. If you're playing a deck where you love to draw cards and you may, maybe you don't have a maximum hand size, you can keep on drawing them until you have a huge hand. Thought with Guard. Tap all creatures and opponent controls. Untap all creatures you control. So you basically tap out everything else. Untap all your stuff. Get yourself ready for protection and prevent, well, any kind of attack against you. That's the idea of it. Twilight Shepherd. It is a flying vigilance persist. When it enters the battlefield, return all cards that were put into the battlefield in, from the battlefield into the graveyard from play to your hand. So everything, doesn't matter the type, any card that went from play to the graveyard this turn that you played Twilight Shepherd, you returned your hand. And this also activates if it goes to the graveyard on its own. It effectively prevents, well, it doesn't stop board wipe, but it gives you all your cards back from a board wipe to replay them. Tyrannize. Target player discards their hand. They may pay seven life in order to prevent this effect. So you either lose your hand or lose seven life. World Purge. Return all permanents to their owner's hand. Each player then chooses seven cards out of all the cards in their hand, shuffles the rest into the library, mana pools empty. This is a big old reset button except for life. You effectively could take, and if you have seven great cards that you have in a combination of what you had in your hand, what you had in play, that you feel are superior to all the opponents, and whatever seven cards they could keep themselves, you could set yourself up to reset the game in a way to much better place. Wart, Raid Mother. When she comes into play, you put two green-red Goblin Warrior tokens into the battlefield. Each green or red spell instant or sorcery that you have, has Conspire. So it gives all your green and or red instants or sorceries Conspire. All your burn spells, all your big booster spells have Conspire. And guess what? It gave you two creatures in which to activate Conspire right then and there. Works pretty good that way. And finally, Wound Reflection. At the end of the turn, each opponent that lost life this turn loses that amount of life Again, an equal amount. So at the end of every turn, let's say that opponent lost five life this turn. Guess what? At the end of the turn, they lose another five life. Doubles the amount of damage your opponents take. Well, it's loss of life, so it's worse. Can't really be prevented then. But that's it for today. So I have introduced you to Shadowmore, the first in a new mini block. We've changed from the land of Lorelin to the less idyllic world of Shadowmoor. And we're going to continue expanding it. Because this one had the ally colored theme. And the next one, Evening Tide, will look to the opposite. The enemy color matches. And how they will develop this entire set some more. Make it very interesting. Kind of a little bit of both mirror in that way. So in a way then both mirroring the Lorwyn block, but also mirroring Shadowmoor. A big concept, this reflection concept that spread throughout here. And as you can see, I've talked about a lot of cards because there are a lot of great and useful cards in this set. It's one of the card sets that I use a lot of cards from for various combos, for various tricks, to combine with other things because they're very good and have a lot of uses, especially in Legacy. I'd check it out. But I hope you're having a great day, and until the next time, I bid you farewell.